we should ban that person from just playing tournaments because they've said such wild like, things about it. I, I, I want to let me ask you because that's kind of my next question for you. I hate to correlate this to poker, but I want to ask you, uh, it, it, Daniel, you're at the poker table, and if you have an individual or multiple people saying offensive things about what's taking place, obviously in Israel, they're talking about politics, whether you agree or not, but they're just saying really despicable things. How do you deal with that as a professional poker player? Do you say anything? Do you keep your mouth shut and just focus on the game? Like, what do you do? Well, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. And I'm, I'm thankful for this. Those conversations rarely come, out of, come up at a poker table and for good reason. You know, it's that old adage, you know, when you're at the Thanksgiving dinner, you don't talk about religion and politics. When you're at a poker table, those subjects probably shouldn't. You talk about how bad this guy played Ace King. That's one thing. <laughs> But to right. get to the depth of that, what you're going to create is blood boiling. And then, you know, the floor might have to be called and then everyone needs to settle down and, sh and shut up because there is there is a couple people, one specifically, you know, in poker who I would probably see at a poker table. And if that discussion came up, my blood would boil. And then I would have to make sure that my selfie stick is with me. Do you mind if I ask you who that is? Uh, it's, I think people in the poker world know. I do. I try not to give him any attention at all whatsoever. No, don't tell me Justin Bonomo. Uh-huh. Justin. It rhymes with... It rhymes with yeah, right, right by. Okay, you're good. Bravo. But I mean, he, you know, there's some tweets I've seen where he really thinks that, like, oh, if Netanyahu wasn't involved, like Hamas would sit down with the Jewish leadership and they would make peace. Name a Jew in the world, name one person that Hamas would sit down with, you know, despite the Hamas char charter saying that's not the goal. You know, you talk about a two state solution, they don't want a two state solution, they want a no Jew state solution. That is their solution. They're not looking to find a way. They've been offered it four to five, six different times since the 1920s. Originally, they were offered 80% of the land. They said no. You know, so there's no. And then he said this one other thing that really just, he he made this equation of like, well, you know, Hamas should at least release the hostages and Israel should release their hostages. He's calling prisoners, terrorists who they've caught and put in prison, he's equating that to hostages, which is young women well, and girls from Germany, from France, from the United States that are in a tunnel right now being potentially raped and beaten and all these things. And I'll tell you what, Mr. If he was listening, I said, you know what? If you were kidnapped by Hamas, you would pray that the IDF is going to come and save you and bomb them to save your life. You sit in your perch, nice and peaceful and say, oh yeah, you're equating the two. How dare you have any sort of, you know, you know, thoughts towards what Israel is doing to defend themselves. They react provoked. They don't, they don't attack Hamas indiscriminately. They're not attacking any sort of sites just right. indiscriminately. They're attacking specifically Hamas sites and they, they hide right, right behind the civilians. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but again, this is the same guy that accused you of abusing women. And uh, I think when you threw your uh, your, your selfie stick, uh, he made that World War III, right? So His clearly brain is broken, frankly. Yeah. And you know what? So here's the thing. You know, people use the term woke. I don't like the term woke, but it does describe an ideology, right? And when you go down this ideological path, what you end up finding is, you know, some similarities here. And what, what I found is, you know, when we think of left, right, I think of it more of a circle, okay? So the center is here. And then when you go around to the far right and the far left, you know what they end up doing? They end up having a common enemy. And it always ends up being the Jews. And why is it the Jews? Why is it the Jews? The Jews, because they've been successful as, as compared to other people. You know, I think for a lot of, you know, the, the ideology on the left, it's this idea of white oppressor that is wealthy and military versus the poor brown folk, right? And they, they view it through that lens. So they're sort of taught to buy into this narrative that the white man, which they consider the Jew, the most oppressed people in history, right, as the evil oppressor, when in fact, what they don't even realize, it's like I said, since 2005, there are no Jews there. There are no Jews in any of these Muslim countries. You want to talk about apartheid? Where are the Jews in Libya? Where are the Jews in Iran? Where are the Jews in Lebanon? They don't exist. There used to be hundreds of thousands of them. They've been pushed out, okay? They have one little sliver, tiny little population, this tiny little sliver, surrounded by nations that want them obliterated. And you don't want them to defend themselves. If they don't defend themselves, if they put down their weapons, there is no Israel. If Hamas and those around them put down their weapons, there's peace. What, what would you say? You know, it's interesting because I had a 24-year-old uh, 